Uh, welcome to part 14. Printer's just about finished really. I'm um, into sort of tuning it, doing temperature towels and retraction tests and setting pressure advancing that for all the different filaments. I have one or two little niggles and, uh, and, a, and a couple of em embellishments. So first thing is, I've said before in a, in a video that I, um, when the power fails and it runs on battery, then obviously the bed isn't heated, um, so it could generate a heater fault. So what I have to do is use either turn the heater off or use silly um, heater fault tolerances so that it doesn't generate that fault. But I want to run the printer all the time like that because um, if there was a genuine fault then I wouldn't know about it. So what I want is some mechanism whereby I can either turn the heater off when it goes off or when the, when the power fails or set some um, silly tolerances and then restore them again when the power comes back on. So there's a couple of relay contacts on the DC UPS itself um, and on the other printer that's what I used but uh, those contacts aren't working on this printer and I think it's because it's not discharging at 2 amps. I think that's the threshold that seems to be um, the criteria for when these relay contacts make it has to be discharging at 2 amps. Anyway, for whatever reason, I can't use those contacts on the UPS, so I need uh, some other mechanism. So the only thing you can do with Duet um, is use an external trigger. So connect something to one of the input pins and it will detect a change on that. Maybe that will change in the future and we can use other events uh, to trigger things. But at the moment it's only IO pin, so I need to connect something to an IO pin to initiate a trigger which will... Um, set the heater fault tolerances to silly numbers when the power fails and restore them to sensible numbers when it... So I need some sort of external device to um, connect to an I.O. pin so I can use that as a trigger to change the heater fault um, tolerances when power fails and restore them when power comes back on again. So I, I could have used the existing ESP32 that I've got that's on the top of the printer and controls the lights. The trouble with that is I'd have had to run a bunch of cables from the electronics drawer in the bottom to the ESP device that's up on the top. And I've kind of run out of spare um, channels in the extruder and uh, the cable chains are getting a bit tight as well. So I elected to install another ESP32. Um, in the electronics drawer in the bottom, close to the board and close to the power supplies. Um, the other thing is I, I might, at some point in the future, want to do some other things as well. So having one down there, close to the duet board, um, seemed like a good idea, and they're cheap enough anyway. So I made up a prototype board. Um, oh, and I bought a couple of these things. So these are um, DIN rail clips, or brackets. So basically they clamp onto DIN rail, and um, then you can screw anything to them. So, so I made up my um, prototype board that will take an ESP32. Um, so what I did with this was I put, um, what I always do is I put female headers on the board, solder them on, and then the board can just plug into that. Um, while I was at it, I also put a row next to each female header, I put a row of male headers so I can, if I want to connect something in the future, I can just use DuPont jumpers or something like that without having to take the whole board off and solder things on it. So I made up a little board, takes an ESP32, it's got um, a couple of, a few two-way connectors to take um, DC voltage going into it and IO pins going out. I connected both the um, ground and the I.O. pin to those two pin connectors because the ESP32 gets its 5 volts and the 5 volt ground is connected to the same ground as the duet ground, they're all connected together. In theory I could probably just have used the I.O. pins and not bothered with the ground but I thought belt and braces, I'll, I'll use both. So then I, I needed to measure the um, the actual battery voltage, or the actual DC voltage, I should say. Um, and of course, um, an ESP or an Arduino or anything like that, the ADCs are only good for about 3 volts or 5 volts, depending on what it is. Um, and I want to measure 27, so I had to use a voltage divider. So I used a potentiometer so that I could trim it 
um, so that I get uh, exactly one tenth of what the DC voltage is. So it's 27.6. Um, I feed 2.76 into it. So I just did that so that it reads the same as my multimeter um, divided by 10. So my multimeter is showing 27.6. The ESP device was showing 2.76. And then I needed some code that would switch the trigger pins. So the I.O. pins on the ESP are connected to I.O. pins on the duet. So if, um, if an I.O. pin goes high, then the duet board will see it's gone high and I can take the appropriate trigger. But I didn't want to use Home Assistant to do the trigger because that would rely on Wi-Fi communication between the ESP32 and my Home Assistant server. And if mains fails, um, which is what I'm looking to detect, I won't have any Wi-Fi because my home Wi-Fi, uh, my mesh network will go down in a power failure. So I needed the actual um, automation um, logic to, be, to happen on the ESP32 itself. Here's the relevant section of code that does that. So basically I created a template sensor which takes the ADC voltage, which is the one that's been divided down to one tenth of uh, of real world voltage takes that and multiplies it by 10 to get <laughs> to get back to um, a, a realistic value um, and then we've got on value range which basically means if the reading is <laughs> um, below 26 a switch turn on mains power fail so there's, there's a switch called mains power fail which is actually a GPIO pin which gets turned on if the voltage is less than 26. So when the mains power fails, it switches over to battery voltage. Um, when mains power is there, I'll get 27.6. So when it fails, it's going to be something less than 20. So I elected 26 volts. So at 26 volts, it will switch that on. Then we've got, um, if it's above 26.5, it will turn it off because it means power must have been restored. And then I've got, um, if it's below 24.4, there's another switch, um, which is the low battery threshold. So 24.4 mean the battery is 50% discharge. Um, if it's above 25, then it will turn off that low battery valve, uh, threshold. So you can see uh, then underneath that piece of um, on value range code, underneath that are the actual switches, which are the platform is GPIO. So GPIO pin 16 is the mains power fail and GPIO 17 is the low battery voltage. So those are connected to pins on the duet, input pins on the duet. So in practice this is what we get. This is the um, uh, dashboard if you like for that um, that I've created for both the ESP32 devices I've got plus the um, integration for Duet shows everything on, on this one page, if you like. So I've highlighted there the mains voltage, that's what I'm reading. And then here's the um, Duet web control page, this is the console. So if I send M570H0, then it reports the heater fault tolerances. So it says there, allowed it allowed excursion 5 degrees, fault trigger time 10 seconds, so it has to be more than five degrees away from its set point for 10 seconds and it'll trigger a heater fault. So then if power fails, which simulates simply by turning the main switch off, uh, you can see here that the mains voltage drops to 25.1 um, and as soon as it gets below 26 then this mains power fail switch that you can see there, that gets turned on. So it means the GPIO pin on the ESP32 has gone high so then if we go back to Duet Web Control, um, you read these from the bottom up. So the, the newest event is at the top, the oldest event is at the bottom. So you can see there's my first M5, M570 command. And then you can see Trigger 2 power. So the, the macro that runs uh, for Trigger 2, the first thing it does is uh, print a message saying Trigger 2 power fail. So <laughs> So I know it's worked. So that macro also then changes the heater fault tolerances. So then if I send m 570 h 0 again, which is I have done there, you can see the heat. The allowed excursion is now 60 degrees C. 
and the trigger time is 3,000 seconds. So yeah, silly numbers, you know, it would have to go, uh, it would have to drop by 60 degrees and stay that way for 50 minutes and then it would trigger a fault. So it's a silly number, it will basically suppress the heat of fault detection from happening while there's a power fail. And then finally, if I restore power, you'll see trigger three, power restored. That's just the message that's the first bit on, on the macro. And then if I send M57080 again, you can see the heater tolerances are back to five degrees and 10 seconds, sensible numbers. So that's all doing what it should. So basically power fails, the heater tolerances get set to silly numbers. The heater fault suppression is, uh, heater fault detection is suppressed. Um, when power is restored, then heat of fault detection is set back to sensible numbers, which is just what wants to happen. Um, I haven't yet um, done anything with, I've got trigger four, which happens if um, the battery voltage gets to 24.4. So that ESP32, uh, GPIO17 or whatever will go high. Duet board senses that. But other than display the message trigger four, it's not doing anything because I want to be sure that's working. What it will do is basically shut down the printer. Um, so if the battery voltage gets below the threshold, it's just going to turn everything off. But I want to be 100% sure that's reliable and I don't get any false triggers or missed triggers for any reason. So if, for example, the ESP32 booted up at a different time to the or took longer or shorter to boot up than the duet board it could potentially trigger that and then the duet board will turn off again so so I want to make sure that's 100% reliable so all it's doing at the moment is is printing a message trigger for should that ever trigger so providing I never see that then I can um, put the relevant commands in the macro to turn the printer off. So that's all onky dory and as I say I've got that extra row of um, um, mail headers on the um, ESP32 board so I can connect other things to other GPIO pins if I want. And I could work the other way as well. I could set a pin high on the duet board and sense that with the ESP32 uh, and take some action or something if that goes high. So quite handy that they both they both talk 3.3 volts, so you can <laughs> digitally talk to each other. <laughs> so that's sorted, and then um, so the other thing I had was the panels I got because they're quite thin. Uh, they were rattling, or or really when the at certain speeds they were kind of it's like a harsh vibration because uh, they were only fixed at you know a few points to the frame. So I got some anti-rattle tape which I fitted. Uh, so basically I had to take the panels off and then this stuff, it's just um, like one mil thick um, sticky back foam. Um, so I just stuck that around the inside of the frame. Uh, picture's not very good but you get a rough idea. And then screwed the panels to that but before I did that I fitted some uh, sound deadening material, this stuff. It's called Dodo Mat and if you're in the UK you'll appreciate that. Um, if you're not in the UK, uh, Dodo is an extinct bird. And we have an expression, if something is uh, completely kaput, uh, we'll say it's as dead as a dodo. So dodo mat for sound deadening matting is um, quite a good name. Effectively it's kind of quite heavy rubber um, with an embossed aluminium coat in one side and then um, sticky, sticky backed on the other. The peel off backing has got a grid pattern on it so it makes it quite easy to cut straight lines. So before I took the panels off I drew around them uh, on the inside. I drew around the inside with a marker pen so I could see exactly where the panel needed to go. I didn't want it to overlap where the frame is. So I managed to cut them out and stick them on reasonably straightly. So here's a, this is the picture. This one is looking down into the printer with the top off. And that one's looking into the printer from the front um, above the bed. And below the bed. And 
And then finally, this is um, again from the front, but looking up at the top. So I haven't covered every square inch. Um, not necessary, really. So it kind of stops any booming sound. So that's worked quite well. It's it's silent now. Well, not silent, but it's um, it's pretty quiet. And you can barely hear it outside of this room. Um, and as my bedroom is there, um, that's good. That's what I need. So if I've got print running all night, it won't disturb, it won't disturb me. So one of the little issues I came across, my up, the upper roller on my print spool holder. Um, it's very light. When on my other printer, um, I had 8mm rods on the end of it that went down into tubes. That's how it was guided. Um, so it was fairly heavy. But this one, because I elected to use those brackets that the side with slots in, there's a lot less weight on the tube. And I did have a situation where pulling filament off the side of a reel, um, the reel actually tilted a bit. It lifted that upper roller and tilted a bit. Um, not a big deal, but annoying. So, anyway, I put a couple of springs on it. So they just pull down a bit on that top roller and um, keeps the filament reel dead centered. And if I want to fit one of those big three kilogram reels, I move the, the back bottom roller back and then there's enough travel on the spring to sit on the top of the big spill as well as the little one. And then finally, one little embellishment. Um, I got a I, got a, I bought a couple of Google Nest hubs when I started getting into home automation, but I um, I quickly decided that rather than say hey, oh, I better not say the wait word in case you've got a, um, home automation devices around, but you say hey wait word, and then um, turn on the desk lamp. Um, I'd much rather the lamp just turns on when there's motion and it's dark, and turns off when there's no motion or if it's light. So it's pretty kind of redundant this device, um, but I thought well I can repurpose that so I can um, cast the dashboard if you like from Home Assistant to this device so it just sits on top of the printer. So here it is and it just sits there. Um, but it, is, it has actually a touch screen so I can still turn the lights on and off or dim them if I want to and the rest. It's all the um, controls and everything from, from both the ESP32 modules and the Duet integration just being displayed there i wouldn't i wouldn't have run out and bought one but as i had it i thought just well i might as well repurpose it and save me reaching for my phone or firing up a computer if i just want to quickly glance at something so that's about it for now i better get back to um tuning the settings i need for uh tpu and flexibles i've done all the rigid ones and that's quite good just a bits with this lgx ace so far um just yeah it's totally different to what i'm used to with a multi-input um hot ends with Bowden tubes, albeit short ones. Um, so I'm used to using sort of 5mm retraction and 0.5 or 0.6 pressure advance and I'm finding the best, best set, I mean, settings on this are sort of 0.04 um, pressure advance and 0.4mm um, retraction and so forth. So yeah, doing well. So I'll be interested, it should be good for flexibles because it's got such a short filament path between the extruder drive gear and the input to the hot end so I'm hopeful uh, but we shall see anyway that will do for now and uh, until next time and thanks for watching bye for now